Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Yoga Break It Down. I'm Yoga Suze. In this episode, we are going to explore revolved half moon pose. And this is a extension of a pose we explored in episode five, half moon pose. It is common for some yoga poses to have a revolved alternative that provides some different stretches. Revolved half moon pose is pretty challenging. It involves balance and balance standing on one leg. So if you have concerns about impacting your knee, please forward towards the end of this video where I'm going to touch on an alternative where we would actually be practicing the same positioning but from a laying on the floor position. In my demonstrations, I will show you how to go into this pose using a chair as a supportive prop, using a block, and using the floor. I find that the chair or the floor are most supportive because of the difficult balancing and transition in this pose, but I will also show the block alternative. Start with placing your chair at the wall as I'm demonstrating so that the side of the chair is against the wall and the seat of the chair will be facing your direction. And we're going to come into half moon briefly before rotating into the revolved half moon. So for half moon, begin by standing at the wall with your back facing the wall and feet facing forward. You're going to turn your foot that's closest to the chair out towards the chair so that the foot ends up parallel to the wall. You want the foot approximately two to three inches from the wall so that you still feel that your pelvis is in contact with the wall. The shoulder blades may or may not be at this point. You don't want to be so close to the wall that it feels like to make room for your pelvis, it's pushing you away from the wall. And you don't want your foot so far away from the wall that you feel like you have to lean back to make contact with the wall. So you should feel your pelvis brushing lightly against the wall with the foot uh, turned out and parallel to the wall. You can then start to make contact with the same side shoulder blade as the standing foot, same side shoulder blade against the wall. So you can sort of lean a little bit in the direction of the chair and lean your shoulder blade a little bit in. So you make sure you have your standing foot in the supportive position, the pelvis is brushing the wall, and that one shoulder blade is brushing the wall. You're going to lean in the direction of the chair and allow the opposite foot to maybe come onto the toes and to scooch a little bit back away from the chair. And then as you lean a little bit more towards the chair, that back foot's going to start to raise. But luckily, you have the support of the standing foot and you have a little bit of support from the wall. And you're going to sort of glide along the wall, make contact with your hand to the chair. So it's same side hand as the standing foot. So if you're standing on the right foot, right hand, standing on the left foot, left hand making contact with the chair. At that point, the back foot will have lifted up. We're going to come briefly into this half moon pose uh, as a starting point before we transition into the revolved position. So you want to bend in the elbow since we're using a chair. We're working on getting the torso and raised leg parallel to the floor. So bend in that elbow as much as you need to, to relax in the shoulder and lower the torso till you sense that you're approximately parallel to the, sh uh, to the floor. You had one shoulder blade against the wall as you were first aligning. And as you are moving into the fuller position, you should feel both shoulder blades touching the wall. Most people to get the torso parallel to the floor will have a significant bend in the elbow but probably not resting the forearm on the chair. That would likely bring you a bit lower so that you're at a diagonal. So just keep the bend in the elbow. 
Now we're going to revolve the pose. We're going to allow the shoulder blades to come away from the wall. You're going to start to rotate your torso to face the chair or the seat of the chair. The upper hand, when close enough, is going to come in contact with the chair. So you're working to a position where the chest is facing downwards and again, bringing the torso more parallel to the floor, both hands touching the chair. The hip should be square and your back leg should be approximately hip height. So think about the ankle being in line with the hip. Likely the hip that was raised that was on top, even though we've rotated and we're working on the hips being parallel, that one hip may still be raised. So that's usually what you have to communicate to drop down in. Now you would think that the communication for that would be communication to the hip to drop. And that's part of it. But in order for that hip to be able to drop, you have to get length from the outside of your standing leg. And this may very well be something you haven't thought about before. So you have the standing foot sinking down into the mat or the floor. As the foot's sinking, you're allowing length up the outside of the standing leg all the way up to the hip. And that is going to allow the rotation of that same side hip to bring uh, the pelvis away from facing the wall to rotating so that that butt cheek is facing now up towards the ceiling. And that's what's allowing the other hip to drop. So you should be able to sense uh, the hips being somewhat square. That action is also what makes this a very deep stretch. And we haven't even revolved yet. We're in the middle position. To come into the revolve position, you need to start to turn your chest ever so slightly to face the wall. As you make that first motion, you are going to feel an increase in the stretch on the outside of the leg into the hip, into the glute, into the lower back. You have contact with your opposite hand onto the chair. You're starting to turn the chest to the wall. Now take your fingers that are closest to the wall. You're going to walk them up the wall. Check in with your shoulder. So your positioning may not look exactly like mine because your shoulder's in charge. So you might find that the hand, instead of being straight up, is a little forward or a little back to make that shoulder more comfortable. And perhaps you don't straighten in the arm fully. Maybe it, there's a bend in the elbow. We may very well likely for this side to place the forearm. Again, that's the forearm of the arm that's opposite of the standing leg. We may very well bring that forearm down to the chair because what we're doing now is we're taking the hip that was on top so the hip of the leg opposite the standing leg was on top of the standing leg hip. Then we brought it parallel to the standing leg hip. Now we are dropping it. So again, all this length starts from the bottom of the foot of the standing leg. And you're allowing that to relax to lengthen the outside of the standing leg all the way up through the standing leg hip and that's allowing the opposite hip to drop. You are working on rotating the chest to face the wall more. You are working on dropping that opposite hip and rotating it so that hip bone starts to face the wall. We always need to make sure that our hip bone, our kneecap, and our toes are in line. So on this raised leg, hip bone starting to face the wall, now you're rotating. Don't think about the knee. We don't want to twist in the knee. You have to think of the entire upper leg rotating so that the um, upper part of the front of the leg faces the wall. And that'll align the kneecap to face the wall. And then we think about the lower leg rotating face the wall so that the shin faces the wall. And that'll help the toes point towards the wall. So we don't want to guide with the kneecap or the toes because that will end up pulling the knee in two directions and causing pain and discomfort. If placing your forearm on the chair 
feels like it's bringing the top of your torso too low and producing a diagonal in the torso and that's throwing you off alignment wise you can again move to having the hand on the chair and a bend in the elbow to sort of customize um, the height there's nothing wrong with the top of the torso uh, being a little lower than the hips as long as you feel you have a good sense of balance and alignment and the support of the forearm on the chair can be significant, can be very helpful. With the hand on the wall, if it's okay, you're reaching the arm up. So this can be a great stretch throughout the arm, the shoulder, and into the pecs. Your gaze can be facing the wall, or you can turn your head to look up towards that upper hand. Take your time when you're ready to release. You're going to come to the neutral position, so you're going to be lowering the arm from the wall, having both hands on the chair, your hips are somewhat square, with your legs still raised behind you, and then you can simply lower that back leg, bend in the knees, and maybe uncurl up to standing like we do in our ragdoll stretches. Make sure to practice this on both sides. Remember, especially with hips, and lower back, each side can be very different. I'm going to continue to demonstrate this now using blocks. So for this, since our neutral position with the chair involved both hands touching the chair, we need to have a setup where both hands can be supported by blocks. So that means we have two blocks here at their highest height. And I recommend the highest height because that is the height that will keep your torso parallel to the floor and not go into that diagonal. This has nothing to do about if you are able to reach the floor or not. If you are able to reach the floor or if the blocks seem a little unstable to you, I will be demonstrating using the floor as a prop in the next variation. So with using the blocks, you can start from the half moon pose again. This is very similar to how we came into it at the wall, except we don't have the wall as a guide. But you still want to sort of sense that imaginary wall in back. So when you place your foot to point towards the standing block, you're going to place these blocks hip distance apart and your feet are going to start out hip distance apart. Or you could think about shoulder distance apart since it's the hands that will be in contact with the blocks. With using the blocks, we're going to come into the half moon pose as we did at the wall, except we don't have the guide of the wall. So we have to have a better mind's eye view of our alignment here. So again, we point the toes of the standing foot towards the one block. We rotate the torso and envision the shoulder blades in line as though they were starting to brush this imaginary wall. We're going to lean a little bit towards the one block, um, scooch the back toes back, and then as we decide to lower to touching the hand to the block, then the back foot will start to come up. In full half moon pose, we raise the back leg as much as we are able to with the foot flexed and the toes pointing forward the same direction as your chest is facing and your eyes are gazing as you first come into this. So coming into a nice full open half moon pose with the opposite arm raised. Once we have extended into our full half moon, we turn the chest a little bit towards facing the floor. We're going to start to drop the hip that was on top just a little bit and then quickly shift our awareness to our standing foot in the outside of that leg. So again, we let that foot sink down into the mat or the floor and we tune into the outside of the leg and we need to allow it to let go, to allow ourselves to lengthen from the bottom of the foot all the way up the side of the leg, all the way up to the hip. And that's what's going to allow that hip that was on top to start to drop a little bit more and to come to a parallel space with the hip of the standing leg. At that time, once we're in the process of lowering that hip to hip height, we're going to take the opposite hand and place it onto the other block. 
So we'll be coming into actually a Warrior Three supported position, as I've shown in another uh, episode. Once you feel stable, and the blocks can feel a little unstable, so this is going to be your preference if you like to work with the blocks or not. The advantage of using the blocks is that it keeps the torso parallel to the floor, opposed to when we get into the variation just using the floor, there may be a little bit more support with the floor, but your torso will be at a diagonal then. So if you feel steady, you're going to keep your opposite hand of your standing foot on your opposite block, and you're going to start to turn the chest a little bit uh, towards the standing leg side. So again, towards your imaginary wall. We need to drop the hip of the raised leg even more. So remember, we were going from two hips like this, and then we're coming to two hips parallel to each other, and then we're dropping that hip that was on top fully so it's under. And we're going to tune into the front hip bone of that lowered hip. We're going to rotate the hip a little bit more so the hip bone starts to face the standing leg. We're going to tune into the upper leg and we need to rotate that entire leg. So you have the front of the leg facing the imaginary wall and that's what's going to turn the kneecap to face there. And then you're tuning into the lower leg, rotating the whole leg so that the shin's facing the imaginary wall. And that's going to help the toes start to face that direction. And with your mind's eye, you're trying to align your foot so that the toes are facing the imaginary wall and the foot is flexed. So it's not pointed and it's not at a strange angle, ideally, which tends to happen. So you really got to tune in to the alignment of that foot. Sometimes as we feel balanced here, we can pick up that block where the hand was because it, it was underneath the shoulder when we were in our warrior three position, our uh, hips square position. And so as you turn, you might feel like you're reaching far in this other direction when the rest of your body is coming into this nice straight line you might feel like your hand's still a little bit further out there. So if you're steady and if you feel like it would work better for you, you can pick up that block and bring it a little closer into the rest of your body so um, you're not reaching so far away. And again, this upper arm is extending upwards. Think straight up over the shoulder. Just like we released at the wall, when you're ready, you're keeping the raised leg raised, you're starting to turn the chest to face downwards. You're lowering the arm that was raised and you're making contact two hands, two blocks. And then you're at that place where you can lower the raised leg, foot to the floor, bend in the knees and uncurl like a rag doll unfolding. The last demonstration is practicing this on the floor. This is a further reach but the advantage compared to the blocks is some people find more stability. If neither the block variation or the floor variation feels stable to you, that is why we have the wall variation. Practicing on the floor, same details in getting into it, toes pointing the direction of where your hand will be, you're pretending you have this wall behind you to guide you, you're rotating the torso to face forward and gain the shoulder blades in line on the imaginary floor. You're leaning a little bit to the side. You're allowing the back foot to start to lift a little bit. And this time your fingertips are going to come all the way down to the floor. So usually straight forward from the standing foot, though sometimes we feel a little better support if we bring the fingers a little bit out to uh, the outside side. And what I mean by this is if you're standing on your right foot and at first you put your fingers right in front of the toes and it's about six inches so it's under the shoulders but that feels a little bit too tight ropish meaning everything's in line which may not feel supportive you can take those fingers and bring them a little bit out to the side and how you might think about this is 
your raised leg takes a little while to come into that nice alignment. So before it does, it's out to the side. So you have standing foot pointing forward, you're raising your leg, but you don't quite have the hip fully rotated, so you don't have that raised leg fully in line yet. So it's out a little bit here. So there's weight pulling you a little bit this way. So if you take your fingers that are here and reach them a little bit this way, you're drawing in two directions, which can sometimes provide stability until you're fully into it. So you're gonna choose a finger or hand placement. I tend to keep fingertips on the floor. Then your concentration is going to move to the hip of the raised leg. And you're trying to rotate that hip open more. And you're trying to get the entire body except for the toes that are pointing out from the raised foot. Try to get the entire body into one alignment. And sometimes I think about um, if there's some type of action movie, and I think this may have been a scenario in one of the Indiana Jones movies, where there's walls coming closer and closer and closer to you, and you have to take up as little space as possible while you're figuring out how to escape so that you don't get squished in the meantime. So your body's taking up that little, little, little space. So you have the toes pointing out, and you might have the hand reaching out the opposite direction, but the more you get the whole body in line, then if you did have the fingers reaching out a little bit, that's the point where they might feel more naturally wanting to come into alignment as well, maybe ending up underneath your shoulders. So coming into the half moon pose on the floor takes a little more time than coming into it against the wall or with your block most likely. Now we're going to take that into the revolved half moon pose. So again, we're lowering the hip of the raised leg. We have to get length from the outside of the standing leg to do that. But this time we gotta take the opposite hand and we gotta make contact with fingers to the floor. So bending your knee at any point of this certainly uh, will help. Once we've made contact, two sets of fingers, two hands to the floor, we've got to drop what was the hip on top, then the hip to the side. Now we got to drop it lower. So we rotate the entire body, except for the standing leg. We're rotating the entire body to face our imaginary wall now. The fingers of the hand opposite of the standing leg, like we use with the block, will be a little bit out to the side. So you have the standing leg and then you, you're reaching with the other hand a little bit out to the side. And you're gonna work on rotating the torso, getting the chest to face more fully the imaginary wall, dropping the hip more. So think about that hip of the standing leg totally lower now than the other hip. We've rotated the hip so much that the front hip bone is now facing the inside of the standing leg then we concentrate on rotating the entire upper leg so that the uh, front of the leg is facing the imaginary wall. That's gonna align the knees so the knees pointing there. And then we concentrate our attention on rotating the whole lower leg so that the shin is facing the imaginary wall and then the toes. And you gotta work on the alignment of the foot and the toes a little bit to get the toes uh, to face the imaginary wall and the foot flexed. Here for balance, You'll probably keep that second hand, the supportive hand, a little bit out to the side for balance. It may not feel so balanced to bring it a little closer and you can play around with that, but I find the difference between using the block and the floor, I like my supportive hand a little bit out to the side. So everything is facing the imaginary wall except the standing leg. You're reaching your higher arm up and having it be an extension from the center of the chest through the shoulder out through the fingertips. For any of these variations that you do, make sure to practice on both sides. And since it involves the hips and the lower back, you will very likely find one side that is easier than the other. 
So I recommend on the more challenging side to either spend a little bit more time on that side or repeating again. So if it's more difficult, holding it for longer may not work and being able to relax into it at the same time. So you may opt for just taking a second turn on that side. So you may start out on your more challenging side then alternate with the slightly easier side, then go back to the more challenging side. Because we're never gonna even those two sides out if we're spending equal time on them uh, or favoring our easier side. If you have been watching this and thinking there is no way in heck you're gonna be able to do this or you started to try it and you fell out of the pose and you're really challenged with this, I have a great alternative for this. And I'm just going to describe it briefly. This is a stretch that we did in the first episode of Yoga Break It Down, which was Tight Legs Break It Down. So as you can see in my example, this is a position that we do on the floor. And it's a position where we've come into a twist and we've either placed the foot on the wall for support or we've used a strap to bring it over to that side. So you might be thinking, what is she talking about? This doesn't look like what we just did in Revolved Half Moon. Look at the foot of the leg that has crossed over to the body. So the foot that's either on the wall or in the strap. That would be your standing foot the equivalent of your standing foot in revolved half moon pose. So as you can see, the whole rest of the body is in this case facing up towards the ceiling and then we have the leg facing another direction which means the kneecap is facing the direction of the head, really. So just imagine if you took this pose and turned it on its side so that the extended foot is actually the standing foot. Then your leg on the floor in the standing revolved half moon pose would be your raised leg. And the torso is in position um, as it is in revolved half moon pose where the shoulder blades are in line. In this case, they're even on the floor. And you either have the arms extended the two different directions out to the side of the shoulders or if you're using the strap, one hand is involved using the strap. So if you think you might like this variation better, I recommend that you go back and watch episode one of Yoga Break It Down. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Yoga Break It Down. Please hit the subscribe button and share this video with friends. Remember that every body needs yoga. So that means Ernestine Shepherd needs yoga, psychologists need yoga, radiologists need yoga, and you, you especially baby, you need yoga too. So I really hope that you join me next time on Yoga Break It Down. Bye bye.